Okay, there it is. There's my countdown. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank the uh, roundtable for inviting me to present today and talk to you about uh, the work we're doing at the NEA Health Information Network and talk about making public health happen in public schools, educator-driven and union-led programming. Um, uh, I think uh, I'm really fascinated by the research that we've talked about today and the great interventions that are scientifically proven to uh, work in schools today. I want to talk a little bit about what we do to try and make them go to scale um, in public schools. And uh, I guess I push this button to make it go. All right. So here's my, uh, here's the overview. We're going to start off by just telling you a little bit about NEA. Uh, talk about the educators' perspectives and priorities because we are a uh, member-driven organization and we, uh, you know, and anything, anything that we're going to be able to push the needle on has got to be appealing to our members. It's got to meet their needs. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and some of the health concerns they've identified. And then two quick case studies uh, about uh, engaging educators uh, through breakfast in the classroom program we do and a school employee wellness intervention we're working on. So the NEA is the uh, largest uh, educator union in the United States. Uh, we are right around 3 million members, which uh, the majority of our members are K-12 to educators, uh, K-12 to teachers, but they're also um, education support professionals like custodians, food service workers, bus drivers, office staff. Uh, we also have uh, student members, retired members, um, and, and uh, higher education members. We have 51 state affiliates, and I point this out because we are not just a large membership organization, but we have a huge infrastructure that reaches into every state and, and, and almost every uh, municipality in the country. There, there are few organizations that have this level of penetration, but also infrastructure. So each one of those school districts has a local with a local president uh, and they have meetings and they talk about issues of concern and they get organized around things that they care about and try to make differences in their schools. So um, we have 51 affiliates, seven, uh, 70,000 schools and 14,000 local organizations. And the members are actively engaged through their local and state affiliates in what they do. So um, I work for a nonprofit that's affiliated with NEA called the Health Information Network, and we try to link what our members care about and what we know in public health practice to work. So let's talk about what our members care about. What's on the mind of educators today? Have, has anybody heard of the Common Core State Standards? This is a big issue uh, down in the trenches or down in the classrooms right now. Um, uh, uh, they, whether you like them or not, it's sucking up a lot of the energy in public schools right now to figure out how they're going to implement them, figure out how you're going to uh, test against them, and how it's going to affect everything. So anytime you can help an educator with Common Core implementation, you got their attention. Another thing, school funding. S public school funding has taken a beating uh, in the recession. It was, it was dreadful. The cutbacks in funding, in staff, Support staff, uh, student to teacher ratios are way out of rack, whack. Classrooms are bigger. Uh, everything that's related to funding is down. Uh, so uh, principals and teachers report their school budget has decreased in the last 12 months. Uh, it's gotten a little better since 2008, 2009, but we're still in a bad funding place, and they need help with that. High, takes, high stakes testing, big concern for our membership. So there's a lot of drive from the U.S. Department of Education, from other entities, uh, about associating uh, testing and teacher performance reviews and these sorts of things. Um, and there's a lot of concern about that because it takes up a lot of time. Uh, we have to teach to the test. Teachers are then evaluated on their test scores, even if they're not connected with the curriculum, because somebody in the state government decided we needed to implement this test. Uh, and it's, it's really frustrating for our members. Testing, 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 what's the point of testing? Um, and it's hard for our members to understand how the data are actually useful in doing their job, uh, which is educating kids. Uh, meeting students, students' individual needs. Teachers, educators don't get into their job because of the money or the status 
and certainly not the status anymore because they're getting all getting beaten up in the public, public sphere. They get into it because they care about kids and they want to make a difference with kids. And they're spacing a classroom full of kids who are at all different levels, have all kinds of different baggage they bring from home every day, and they're trying desperately to find a way to meet all their needs. Um, so, uh, and at all ends of the spectrum, as you can see from this quote. Uh, professional growth, uh, I think we underestimate the fact that this is a profession, and a lot, of the, a lot of times the only way you can advance in this profession is to get out of it and become an administrator. You just sort of get, get into one, uh, teaching, and, and a lot of districts, there's no way to improve your standing or to aspire to other than teaching. And the options for professional growth are getting uh, harder and harder to find in, in uh, teaching. Uh, so here's our, here's, here's our member. Uh, so this is what's on her mind right now. Uh, so now let's talk about, there, there are some health things that are on their mind, so let's talk about that briefly. We did this survey of 1,200 active members last year uh, to gauge their perspective on health concerns that impede student learning. So I'm just going to, it was a, a very uh, interesting survey. I'm just going to share this one item, which was uh, an aided recall item. So you had a list of health concerns, and we asked people to rank them. So when we at HIN decide what issues we're going to work on, this is uh, a big factor in uh, how we decide what's important. So we see inattention and hyperactivity, stress among staff as being top concerns, and stress among issues. It's disappointing to me as a public health professional, especially when I have people like Dr. Bosch back here telling me that you know vision and the link between vision problems and uh, achievement are well linked. But look where it lands on the, uh, on the list of 20. Uh, it comes down near the bottom here. Vision problems among students. It's, it's at the bottom of the list in 20. It's too bad, but with, with me, as my, what I can bring to the table is motivating members to do stuff. I have to look at that and wonder, well, am I going to do a vision program? Or am I going to focus on something that they already, we, they already care about, which is behavior problems that are disrupting the educational environment of the classroom? So that's what I think about all the time. Uh, so, how do we, uh, how do we make, a, make a difference on uh, public health? We uh, develop science-based initiatives that respond to NEA member concerns. We constantly seek ed edu educator engagement and feedback throughout the development process. We design interventions to link their priorities with health programming. And we work across the NEA infrastructure to institutionalize change. And that's the, the great thing about a union. At, with the kind of infrastructure we have, and I'll give you a couple examples of where we work there. First one is uh, Breakfast in the Classroom, which is uh, funded generously through the Walmart Foundation, and we work with the School Nutrition uh, uh, Foundation and uh, the FRAC, uh, Food Research and Action Council on this. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Breakfast in the Classroom, I'll give you a 30-second introduction. The idea of Breakfast in the Classroom is there. If you look at uh, schools that have free and reduced lunch, you have maybe 80% of the eligible kids are getting lunch, and maybe 40% of them are getting breakfast. And this is a big problem, because a lot of them are coming to school, they haven't eaten that day, they maybe haven't eaten since uh, lunch the previous day. And uh, teachers see you, a kid can't uh, do well in class when they haven't eaten. So if you bring breakfast to the classroom, it uh, reduces the stigma of them having to go to the cafeteria and get breakfast. It, may, it reduces the barrier. They don't have to get there earlier. They just come with the regular kids. And it streamlines the whole process. Plus, our approach is a universal breakfast. So you, you don't check uh, you know, eligibility cards. Everybody gets it for free. Uh, and the finances actually work out thanks to um, uh, the USDA bill. OK, so uh, obviously, child hunger is a big issue. We know this. It affects performance. Uh, and joint action for breakfast programs through uh, federal nonprofit funding can make a difference. So what do we do? We go into we, we go into our infrastructure from the first from the state level to the local level. We engage the local leadership and say, look, this is what we want to do in the classroom. Here's how it can make a difference. Can we get your support for talking to the members about it? Once we get that support, then we hold a meeting with everybody who's involved. If you think about breakfast in the classroom, it involves a lot of our members. You gotta get the food service people. We've got to be convinced they can do something different. It'll work. 
You got to get the custodial staff on board because bringing food into a classroom br brings up a whole lot of issues about disposing of trash and vermin and these sorts of things you got to deal with. And most importantly, you got to get the teachers to agree that this is not something that's going to put more, be a big fat hassle for them and interrupt the instructional day. So we do the, these meetings, and before we start implementation, we get the full buy-in from all stakeholders. Um, and the result is that, and we answer every question, they have a clear understanding of their role and how it fits. The result is when we implement breakfast in the classroom, um, once, you, once you get through that process, which like any public health process is pain because you got to get a lot of people to a lot of meetings and answer all their questions and deal with all this stuff, but once you get through that, it works. And you don't have stuff happening on the back end like other organizations have implemented breakfast. We have pushback from the union because the teachers are, are angry because of the, they, they haven't been heard. Uh, so as of 2013, we've reached uh, 70,000 students who have benefited. And I'm not taking credit for this law in Colorado, but I will say we had a very successful breakfast program in Denver, Colorado that was featured widely throughout the state. And subsequently, the state legislature passed legislation to fund breakfast in the classroom in certain school districts with a high, fra uh, high fraction of free and reduced meals across the state. That's sustainability. That's what we're looking for. Uh, here are some quotes from uh, the successful, the, the satisfied customers, if you will, from breakfast in the classroom. Uh, teachers, teachers don't have to be convinced that hunger is a problem. They see the difference that's being made. Um, and uh, this has offered them an opportunity to really make a difference on something they care about. So what are the lessons learned? It's important to engage educators to ensure a smoother implementation and to ensure sustainability, because when we leave, the union still bought into the program and it keeps on going. So we collaborate with education and union associates. I'm down to three minutes and I don't want to sell uh, school employee wellness short. So this is a quick uh, overview of how we plan to leverage union association infrastructure to confront uh, school employee wellness and we're working with Kaiser Permanente on this. So as you know, the CDC con considers school employee wellness a an important aspect of coordinated school health and school health in general. And uh, who health promotion activities improve productivity. Uh, health promotion activities to employees have improved productivity, decreased absenteeism, and reduced health insurance costs. So what we did, with the help of Kaiser's, do a um, uh, sort of organizational assessment. How ready is, is NEA to take on this issue? Um, and uh, the, there were, there were a bunch of elements to this, but I want to focus on one element, which was with what is called Uniserve staff. So the Uniserve staff in the NEA world are kind of like your shop stewards. So they are uh, staff members that, don't, that used to be an educator but have been pulled out and are full-time dealing with union members to help them with their issues. The issues could be a disagreement with management, uh, a, a problem, in, uh, a health problem they're having, uh, they could be organizing around uh, political campaigns, they, uh, a, a whole number of things. These guys and gals do a lot of stuff because they are the front line of the union and the association to get stuff done. When we surveyed them about school employee wellness, 93% uh, uh, of them believed the association should promote wellness programs. These are people who have way too much to do, and they're telling us, we want to do something about this. This was very thought-provoking to NEA leadership to see this, that they're willing to take this on and they consider this important. So, um, so uh, what we're looking at in the next steps for this is to uh, work with uh, the national, the state, and the locals to see how we can set up incentives for um, uh, promoting wellness activities and disease management, for on-site delivery of health uh, services, screening services, and prevention services. Stress management, stress is a huge problem in national surveys. Teachers are reporting their stress is way up um, over the last five years. Satisfaction with the job is way down. We see that as connected. So stress management has got to be an important part of it. And the creation of support of wellness task forces. Every, every district is required to have a uh, wellness plan, but not a lot of them are doing much against them. There's the opportunity with union and association engagement to uh, uh, to uh, follow up on those plans 
and then changing the physical and policy environment to reduce barriers to individual behavior change. 12 seconds to go. Local educators possess incredible insight. They know their students and their families. They're members of the community that routinely prioritize students' needs over all else. It's very hard to get them to talk about their own stuff. But if you can connect their health and state and their productivity to student needs, they're, go they're going to go for it. Or at least that's what we're counting on. And a project succeeds once it captures the educator's imagination as they understand how it benefits their student. Union involvement can accelerate the process and can catapult it forward. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jim. Next, we have Norris Dickard, the Healthy Students Group Leader at the Office of Safe and Healthy Students at the U.S. Department of Education. <laughs> 